So again, good morning and welcome, and thank you for joining us for the second annual celebration of the Cure Corridor here today. This year's theme is de Delivering the Cure. And you know, as I I've oftentimes have said, of course, I think the environment here in Scottsdale leads to a collaboration of innovators, world-renowned physicians, and leaders in the biomedical and bioscience industries, and who are at the cutting edge of research, education, clinical trial activity, and world-class patient care. I also believe the collaboration is strengthened and gets stronger through awareness and opportunities to cross-connect at events just like this. So welcome again, and I think that's a, that's a worthy endeavor for us. This industry provides two and a half billion dollars of economic impact to our community. And of course, with the professional employment, the average salary is a high wage salary for our workforce that's available here, as well as what's brought into our community. The economic impact on Scottsdale is something that is impressive, and we have, so have some more information on that in a little bit. But first, let me introduce my council colleagues that are here with us today. We have Dennis, uh, I should say, Councilman Dennis Robbins, Councilwoman Virginia Cordy, and Councilman Bob Littlefield. And we have also with us our newly elected council members, David Smith and Kathy Littlefield. I'd also like to take a moment at this time to thank our sponsors who made this all possible, really, and that is the Plaza Companies, APS, Kitchell, and the Arizona Bio Industry Association. So thank you very much for that support. You know, I wanted to just talk a little bit, just for very briefly, about a few companies that I think emulate, uh, or epitomize rather, the, the companies that have used innovation and technology and collaboration to improve the efficiency of access to health care and thus the cure. One of those companies is ZocDoc, who uh, moved here from the New York area, or opened an office here from the New York area been here for a few years and they've already had two expansions and they're now at 173,000 square feet and they're hiring on top of the 100 employees they have here right now another 60 or more uh, within the next year. And their business is really to provide an easy access to healthcare providers for their clients through apps. Accolade is another technology is a technology company that's enabling consumer engagement company that's dedicated to improving healthcare efficiency of access and, of course, the overall experience, which is also a, another uh, means toward a cure or in finding that cure. But they've expanded their operations with the opening of new offices here. They're from the East Coast as well. And they expand their workforce. They now plan on expanding their workforce by another 300 folks. In September, I attended a ribbon cutting for the North Valley Surgery Center. Center. This is a five and a half million dollar investment in our community that is a joint venture between Sovereign Healthcare and Scottsdale Lincoln Health Network. This is a state of the art facility, provides efficient access to a quality and technologically advanced outpatient surgery. And I think it truly speaks to the collaborative spirit of the Cure Corridor. Then there's Magellan, a healthcare benefits firm who moved their headquarters to Scottsdale from Connecticut. This company is expected to be one of Arizona's top 10 with a projected revenue of $3.6 billion. Also very exciting is the Arizona expansion of, of Theranos, who I'm pleased to report found a home, a new home in Scottsdale at Skysong, the ASU Scottsdale Innovation Center. Today we will hear from Elizabeth Holmes, the founder and CEO of Theranos, who is revolutionizing the diagnostic and patient care industry. There's so much exciting news that's happening here in Scottsdale and in the Valley, it's impossible to share it all with you right now. But in a few months, or a few moments, uh, we will welcome six leaders in their fields for a rapid fire presentation on their plans for the future. So I wanna give special thanks to all the great speakers and presenters with us here today. And on behalf of this, the city and the citizens of Scottsdale. I would like to say we're proud to have you in our community and are grateful for the breakthroughs in research and treatment that are changing and saving lives worldwide. Now in a moment, Roger Downey 
communication manager of Global Med, right here in Scottsdale, a worldwide leader in designing and manufacturing telemedicine delivery systems. And with his 30 years of experience in front of a mic or camera, we're delighted that he's able to facilitate the rapid fire session from the, some of our most dynamic healthcare industry leaders. So thank you and enjoy the program. I'm Roger Downey from Global Med, and I'm proud to be with you here this afternoon. Well, it's almost afternoon. And while you're enjoying your lunch, we figured you would like to at least hear from some of our keynote, well, our facilitators. And let me explain what we're doing here today. This is a rapid fire facilitation situation. And here's our challenge. Each of our speakers would easily be a featured keynote speaker at most events. Our challenge today is we're only going to give them five minutes each to speak prior to our keynote facilitator. Now, the bios for each of our six speakers are in your program. I don't think I need to go over them because that will just eat up time. And we want to get through them and get you back to where you came from today before it's uh, middle afternoon, obviously. So we're going to begin. I'm going to introduce each one with a very minimal amount of information, have them come up here. They'll speak for five minutes, and then we'll introduce another speaker. Our first facilitator is Marty Schultz. He is a senior policy director for the national law firm of Brownstein, Hyatt, Farber, and Shrek. Marty. I'm going to do an uncharacteristic five minutes, and I'm sure that the mayor and Danielle will tell me when five minutes is up. Uh, good afternoon. Um, can't tell you how pleased I am to be here. Uh, I am here, I think, as the chairman of the, uh, of the Bioscience Roadmap, the Arizona Bioscience Roadmap Steering Committee, which is sponsored by Flynn Foundation. And today, uh, the Flynn group here is here, uh, including the president and CEO, Jack Jewett. Um, Ten years ago, Flynn established the uh, Arizona uh, Bioscience Roadmap, and I'm going to go through some history, some goals. Now, here's the only dilemma I have. Mayor Lane, it's made it very clear to me that Scottsdale is the center of activity with regard to the Cure Corridor, with regard to health, innovation, and frankly, he is one of a few mayors, local governmental officials, who is actually able to validate that word. A lot of people say, hey, we're really doing a lot in our community, but Mayor, to your credit and to the credit of Scottsdale and to the credit of the entrepreneurs and the businesses here, it is amazing. It is amazing how well you have done in a relatively short period of time as it is amazing that Arizona has done well in a short period of time, because 10 years ago, Arizona really had, over 10 years, 10, 11 years ago, uh, Arizona really had very little uh, in the way of uh, biosciences. Health systems were not as into research as they are now. Translational activities were not as robust, and the universities were not as well-placed and well-positioned as uh, they are. The state of Arizona was pretty good with some NIH monies, but not as good as we have been over the years. Uh, we've done very well with regard to employment. I'm not going to lay on all these statistics, but I'm going to tell you where to get them. We have done very well with regard to taxes, with regard to drug discoveries. Very impressive. Now with regard to the slides. Okay. Um, in summary, Arizona is globally uh, competitive and a national leader in biosciences. And in all those fields that you see up there, because of the work that many of you have done, predecessors, and to some extent, I think it's fair to say that the Arizona Bioscience Roadmap Steering Committee, which are really individuals in this room and individuals from all over the state, have participated in doing their thing very well, but they've also collaborated because we in Arizona do have a collaborative gene. Um, moving the, they said that there was a clicker here, and here it is. Okay. Not bad. Um, defining biosciences, 
not only uh, cancer uh, in our key disease states where we research, but instead agriculture, uh, the drugs and pharmaceuticals and diagnostics, medical devices, research testing, uh, bioscience related distribution and hospitals. I wish I could talk about all the companies, but I'll show them to you at the last couple of slides. Um, we are the entrepreneurial hub, um, and that's part of the goals, what I'm showing you, that are consistent with strategies that are implementable and have been implemented uh, and need, obviously, some more robust activity. Research into practice. Uh, many of you who are in this general realm know what we're talking about in terms of uh, bench activities, in terms of uh, entrepreneurial research investment. We have some investors in here. In fact, Arizona's um, uh, research activities and then translational activities has been uh, exceptional. Uh, Biotalent, that really w it makes us what we are. Those of you who have come from elsewhere, I want to say to you, thank you so much uh, for coming from Brian, Philadelphia. And other, everybody else here has been uh, coming uh, either from somewhere else or you're homegrown but it's about the talent and it's about the key universities and the key educational activities that we have. Connectivity, um, one of our goals at the uh, roadmap and one of the things that's very key, key is uh, collaboration in Arizona. Now, in the few uh, clicks I have left, I just wanna show you, here are the new research institutes uh, and entities over the last uh, decade. And I wish we could go into each one because each one has a marvelous story. And we have the new facilities. There's a lot of facilities that are either uh, autism oriented, cancer oriented, um, the biomedical campus is there. There's so many of these that are Scottsdale oriented. So Mayor and your team, congratulations on that. Finally, we have new incubators and accelerators that are listed uh, in this slide. That's a very important part of our activity. And we have new uh, or expanded major companies, including companies in Scottsdale. And finally, new schools and educational uh, programs that um, are key and fundamental to the biosciences in Arizona. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I thank you for allowing us five minutes and for me, it's only a moment or two beyond my five minutes. So, Mayor, that is pretty good. And congratulations to all of you. Can't wait to hear the other presenters and Ms. Warren. Thank you, Marty. Our next uh, facilitator, Dr. Michael Gordon. He is the medical director of the Virginia G. Piper Cancer Center Clinical Trials Program at Scottsdale Lincoln. Even though it says Scottsdale Healthcare in your program, they're very closely connected and he prefers Lincoln today. Dr. Gordon. Thank you very much. It's really part of that transformation that's going on in healthcare. And as an aside, I'm not sure 14 years ago when the Flynn Foundation first funded the development of the Arizona Research Consortium as the benchmark of what became the biomedical roadmap that one would have envisioned this coming to fruition, but it's really been a, a great opportunity to see people coming together, and I'm pleased to be here now. So I wanted to uh, focus for a moment on some of the new advances at uh, the Virginia G. Piper Cancer Center Clinical Trials Program in Pinnacle Oncology Hematology. We focus on uh, our attention on new drug therapies and getting better drugs into more patients faster. It's really about getting the cure to the patient because it's great for us to sit and talk about the cure corridor, but the proof ultimately is in the patient care setting. And as many of you have seen and many of you know, one of the new advances in cancer therapy are a whole host of new immunotherapies that are coming out now FDA approved in some cases, but being developed across a broad spectrum of cancer treatments. So as a treatment, immunotherapy has the potential to minimize those that we think are as classical chemotherapy-related side effects, much more attractive to patients because the concept of using drugs to enhance their immune system to fight the cancer rather than traditional poisons to fight cancer. And we have known about immunotherapy for decades because we know that there's the ability to actually cure 
a small percentage of patients with select diseases like melanoma and kidney cancer, about 7 to 10 percent, with very dose-intense and toxic high-dose interleukin-2. And newer agents with much broader applicability are now being developed for more common diagnoses, and that's really the biggest issue. So what is the history of immunotherapy? Just as a quick background, there are certain proteins normally made in our body called cytokines, interleukin-2, interferon. These were the benchmark drugs two decades ago that we used routinely for treating certain cancers like kidney cancer and melanoma. And in the 1980s, when Dr. Steven Rosenberg at the NIH first explored interleukin-2 and showed activity in certain diseases, there was a disappointment at the fact that it wasn't broadly applicable. The next generation of drugs that were approved only in the last two to three years include antibodies that target a regulatory protein on T cells called CTLA-4. These are the breaks on the T cells. And when you cut these break lines, the immune-acting cancer-fighting T cells go rampant like teenagers at a party. And they attack the cancer. They also have a series of toxicities and side effects that are challenging. Um, current agents include a family of drugs called the PD-1 and PDL one antibodies. And I tell patients that when these cancer-killing T cells march on the battlefield, they send up flares to chart their course to the cancer. And when the cancer sees that flare and knows it's about to come under attack, it develops a protective barrier around itself called PDL1. And when the T cells contact PDL1, they die. So the ability to rip up that barbed wire fence or somehow protect those T cells in a suit of armor allows them to go ahead and do their job in many different diagnoses. And, and this is really where, in some ways, the future of cancer care is taking us. And these are the drugs that are leading to eradication of cancer in patients with metastatic disease and will cure greater numbers of patients as they are studied and employed in earlier stage cancer. But there are now on their heels a whole host of different drugs, the OX40 agonists, which we're now studying. And these are, I tell patients, the logistical drugs. These are the logistical cells, because those soldier T cells can't kill the cancer if they don't have the ammunition and the rations and the gas for their tanks. And so as we look down the road, we see a future of combinations of these agents where we will be eradicating cancer in patients with metastatic disease. We will be treating patients in the adjuvant setting with less toxic therapy and hopefully curing greater numbers of patients. This is just a symbol, simplistic overview of the way these PDL1 drugs work. They are complicated. The immune system of our bodies is complicated, but suffice it to say, they are a critical regulatory pathway between the, the cancer cells and our lymphocytes and our lymphocytic helper cells. And in a simple term, when the cancer cell expressing this PDL1 protein makes contact with its parent receptor on the T cell, the T cells die and the cancer cells grow. And if you block this receptor protein interaction with an antibody that binds the barbed wire fence and prevents it from attaching to its receptor, then these T cells grow in number and they kill the cancer. It's really very straightforward and very connected. All right, let's see. There you go. And so I just wanted to show you one example of a case because doctors always love cases. And this is a 58-year-old gentleman with metastatic clear cell kidney cancer. He had previously been treated with high-dose inter interleukin-2 twice. He had had all of the new oral drugs. He had had the IV drugs. He was on literally his last legs. He had had to stop working, and worse yet, he had had to stop bowling which was his huge passion. He started on one of these PD-L1 antibody drugs on December 12th of 2011. And I just want to show you some pictures for those that are not radiologists. The arrows define sites of disease in his chest. 
And now, three years later, these are his most recent CAT scans, you can see almost complete eradication of those nodes, which we believe probably contain no active disease, but we don't know for sure. And similarly, here's a large lymph node mass in the back of his abdomen, and again, three years later, gone, and um, he is back to work, unfortunately not back to bowling because he hurt his wrist and can't bowl anymore. So what's really amazing about these new drugs is the, side, the, the activity is seen in a broad spectrum of common diseases, lung cancer, melanoma, where pembrolizumab, the first of these drugs, is now FDA approved, squamous cell carcinoma, the head and neck, triple negative breast cancer, bladder cancer, um, and other cancers such as small cell lung cancer. And um, ironically, despite their uniform activity, they are much better tolerated. So our portfolio of studies in our joint program continues to depend upon these agents. Combinations of the earlier mentioned CTLA-4s and PDL1 antibodies, new vaccine trials that are exploring these agents, and our program is committed to setting the standard for advanced cancer immunotherapy with phase one drugs, as I mentioned now, of these OX40 agonists, which are now in clinical trials. And so at the Virginia G. Piper Cancer Center and at Scottsdale Lincoln and at Pinnacle Oncology, our initiative is focusing on the expansion of our already successful drug development initiative by merging the components into a dedicated center providing access to better and more diverse, diverse drugs to our patients, expanding the interface with community-based oncology because we're committed to marrying up with the doctors that are at the front line taking care of patients, getting our drugs to more patients, and developing the platform for en enhanced cancer supportive care services because as we treat patients and bring them back to health and wellness, we have to prepare to get them back to a general behavior where they're employed, they're active, and they're contributing to, to our community at large and getting away from the prospect of death and dying. So with that, I'll stop and thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Well, as you can tell, there's so much good information, it's really difficult to hold people to five minutes. Our next, our next facilitator is J.D. Weir. He is the CEO of Primus Pharmaceuticals, which is a specialty pharmaceutical company. Mr. Weir. Welcome. Thank you. Appreciate being here. We're a different type of a pharmaceutical company uh, in that we bring products to market that are truly innovative. And so when the mayor talks about the cure corridor and being able to cure diseases, we're able to restore or rebalance the underlying cause of certain chronic diseases. Think of them as metabolic processes that generally occur with age, and therefore we're creating a more safe and earlier intervention to manage the disease process. We were established in 2001. We're headquartered here. We're privately owned. Um, we develop and commercialize our own branded products, but we in-license those compounds and create the products from all over the world. Many of our compounds have come from Europe, Asia, etc., because they often create the innovation that we sometimes are a little bit behind on in this country. Um, our process of finding these innovations comes from working with universities and also our own uh, kind of proprietary discovery uh, process. Um, we have 18 patents, over 70 published papers. We do a lot of our own original research, working with collaborators. Everything we do is proprietary. All of our products are by prescription, although many of them are natural compounds. And we have a dedicated sales force, as you think of pharmaceutical reps who call on doctor's offices, calling on specialist physicians like rheumatologists and OBGYN uh, physicians. So we're, we're different in that our company focuses on natural compounds and bringing them into kind of our current and future uh, disease states. So think of pharmaceuticals, prescription drugs prior to the 1970s as the vast majority containing plant or animal derived active ingredients. 
We then moved to synthetic compounds as an industry, and we did so moving toward higher and higher science to gain additional patent protection, to offer more therapeutic or efficacy innovation. And in doing so, oftentimes we traded off safety. But natural compounds often can, you know, inherently have more safety because the mechanism of action or the way the products work in the body is more balanced. Um, that's maybe one of the reasons why we have OTC dietary supplements being so prevalent and, and an $8 billion industry in our country. So Primus really integrates Western pharmaceutical science and natural compounds from all over the world, and really that's what the baby boomers want. We're looking toward disease management, earlier interventions as prescription products with more safe therapies, and in doing so, allowing the patient to have a product that's so safe they can use it long-term and not have the, call it, uh, side effect trade-offs. So a few examples. Osteoarthritis. Our lead product is Limbral. Limbral is unique in that it is the next generation beyond COX-2 inhibitors like Celebrex, Vioxx, and Bextra. Um, it's unique in that it works on a balanced mechanism of action or multiple inflammatory processes without being selective to any one. The slide here on the left, knee pain, for example, which is a common area for arthritis, um, should not be causing the picture to the far right as we're facing the slide, which is a bleeding ulcer. Glad that we're done with lunch, I guess. Um, but people don't realize that bleeding ulcers from the use of arthritis medications is very prevalent. A few hundred thousand people per year die from bleeding ulcers simply by taking their arthritis meds. And our product doesn't cause this because it's balanced across multiple inflammatory processes. That's really what the middle picture is intended to represent. We don't cause heart attacks. We don't cause strokes. We don't cause blood thinning. This product is a remarkable product in its safety, but it also is as effective as any of the leading prescription drugs you could find. What's unique? The two ingredients are flavonoid compounds. Flavonoids are the, the, the compounds with health benefits in fruits and vegetables, um, and, and each of these have been used in Asia for thousands of years. The combination of the two is proprietary and very unique. Our product in osteoporosis, Fostium. This is also balanced in its mechanism and how it works. And that is the bone turnover process, the process of building bone. You have bone building cells and bone eating cells. And most drugs are really designed to focus on one part of that process. But bone turnover really is more effective if you can work on both parts in a more balanced way. That's what Fostium does. This compound is derived from also an isoflavone kind of a source, broadly in the polyphenol family. And what's different about it is it builds bone at about the same rate as, as other common drugs like Alendronate or Fosamax on the left-hand side, but it builds better quality bone without the side effects. On the right-hand side, you can see more even filling in of the bone mineral across the matrix. That shows actually a depiction of higher strength, better quality bone. We actually have this published in the British Journal of Medicine. But Fosamax you know, is, a, is a wonderful drug. It's a bisphosphonate drug. It's very effective, helps a lot of people. Our product works as well, but is more safe. No esophage esophageal burning. It does not cause uh, osteonecrosis of the jaw. It's, you don't have to take eight ounces of water or stand or sit upright when you take the product. Um, chronic venous insufficiency, that's a term for what we often see presented as swollen legs, um, what, what is generally caused from a breakdown of vein walls over time as we age. This product contains another flavonoid compound coming from Europe that rebuilds vein walls, improves circulation, and actually can heal ulcers. This is actually a vascularia couple of patients the top with a, a diabetic type of an ulcer, um, below is a venous ulcer, and you can see in about 60 days the ulcer is healed. So in general, to wrap up, Primus is based here, a unique 
kind of a company and that we offer more safe alternatives as prescription products. We're looking to grow. We'll be doing that through some strategic partnerships. We're looking to expand here within the state and also performing more R&D. We have really unique products in, in novel areas like HPV and diabetic neuropathy in our pipeline. And we're excited to be a part of the Cure Corridor. Thank you. Thank you. Moving right along now, David Bennett is the Executive Vice President of Healthier Populations for Orion Health. David Bennett. Thank you, everyone. Good morning. Okay, I'm going to talk a little, I'm going to try to do this fast. We have a lot of interesting technology that I'd like to talk about, but we don't have time. Uh, first thing I want to talk about that's exciting about Orion Health is uh, we just went public last Wednesday, which is pretty exciting. Um, and I will tell you, I was doing uh, the non-deal roadshow and the deal roadshow, and it was quite complex explaining to Australian institutional investors and New Zealand institutional investors where we went public, what the U.S. healthcare system was about, and explaining payers. So it was quite interesting. Um, we're, we're worldwide. Uh, we're kind of unique. Uh, we have software that actually has longitudinal patient records in our systems worldwide for our entire countries or trust or regions, like, and I'll talk about one of them. We're chasing markets that are quite large. Uh, population health management market is, is very, very large market from a software and a services perspective. We're a software company. Um, last year was about 13 billion, growing to 40 billion. In addition, we're, we're chasing the consumerization space because longitudinal patient records with biometrics and other data is quite valuable in the context of proactive care for patients. I think most of you know this. There's a lot of waste in our system, and we believe uh, at Orion that we can actually change healthcare a little bit and change the world, and we think we can do it through technology. I think one of the things that everybody knows about healthcare, it's shifting to a data-driven model. Um, so you're going to see more and more of this industry shift to a data-driven model. You're going to see proactive care models wrapped around that. And the volume of data is going through the roof. Um, to describe our technology, I thought I'd tell a story real quickly. Um, I have a son with cystic fibrosis. Does, do any of you know what that is? Very, very tough disease. Um, about three years ago, I went to the doc to tell the doc we're really excited about a new drug coming out specifically for his mutation. Uh, the doc said, oh, he can't take that drug. Now let's pause there. The doc really doesn't have the cognitive support to do his job. It's not that he was a bad doc. Uh, the reality is there's so many variables now a doc has to deal with. They really don't have the tools to actually do their job. So today he's playing football. Three years later, he's a captain of a football team. And could you guess which one he is? Which one do you think he is? The which one? The big smile on the right or in the middle? Because normally CF kids are small, right? They have Thrive issues, they're very small. Actually, he's the big one on the right. And he's bigger than that now. I'll show you a picture later. So great story of precise medicine at its best. And one of the things that Orion Health is delivering is technology to provide that cognitive support, adding longitudinal patient records, uh, genome information, uh, trial information into a single system and providing not only cognitive support to docs, but also to patients and caregivers to help them with their care. Here's our technology stack. We actually focus on all aspects of population health from an open platform. And uh, not to really go into the detail of it, I'll actually tell you an example of a customer. Has anybody heard about CalIndex, this, this new initiative with two large payers, competitive payers, that are actually building a population health management platform that is going live in the next week or so on our platform. So they're using our platform to provide a longitudinal patient record and a population health management platform for analytics and proactive care for about half of Californians, which will be 20 to 23 million members. That is the largest population health management solution in the world, and it'll be live in the next couple weeks. So pretty exciting. And it's interesting because Blue Shield of California and Anthem were the two that partnered to actually deploy this platform. So pretty exciting. I know it's complex, and I won't get into that. On the consumerization side, one of the things that we've done is actually integrated into TuNet and Apple and some of the other devices so we can bring this world of uh, clinical and payer data to the biometric, biometric patient inner data. And I know with a patient that has chronic diseases, you actually need to provide both the clinical information with the biometric information to provide and care plans to actually provide the best possible proactive care. 
Here's some of our technology. I'm not going to go into that a lot. But uh, to finish, and I think I covered all this, uh, he is the big one on the left-hand side. So he's a senior this year. He's six foot two, 225. And I can tell you right now, most kids with CF couldn't play this sport. And I'm really thankful for some of the, the drugs coming out there. And I'm really, really excited about the technologies that Orion is bringing. And, and this is the first development center in the US for Orion Health. Orion Health is based out of Auckland. Today, we have about 75 people growing to 500 people. And we're, we're really focused on this whole concept of big data analytics, care coordination, and these big linear scale distributed systems. So thank you very much and enjoy the conference. Just in case you wonder, he plays defensive tackle. Our next facilitator is the professor of biomedic informatics, biomedical informatics at ASU and Mayo Clinic, Dr. Robert Greenus. So um, actually, it's a good thing following the previous talk, because I think some of the things that we're doing uh, complement uh, the idea of grappling with the changes in the health industry and the healthcare delivery system that, are, that we're all facing. We're seeing a uh, transformation to a shift to wellness, a shift to prevention, a pre uh, shift to early detection and management of disease. We're um, seeing a lot of explosion of devices that consumers are carrying for wellness and fitness that are going to expand more and more into uh, connected care. And what's interesting is that the health IT industry is kind of antiquated. Let me see if I can make sure this moves. So I just uh, didn't realize I was going to have slides right in front of me, so it's a little hard to see. But basically, uh, we've ha gone, gone through in recent years with the um, Recovery uh, Act and the stimulus package a massive expansion of the number of e electronic health record systems that are being uh, purveyed and uh, use of them in every doctor's office. But the problem is that a lot of those are silos. They're proprietary systems. Uh, the data doesn't come in and out of them very easily. And the connected care that I'm talking about, the emphasis on wellness, the emphasis on the continuity across the spectrum of patients' lives, uh, isn't achievable with this system. And so even though uh, it's great that we have more of that electronic uh, uh, or computerization of the healthcare uh, field, we've uh, stuck ourselves in a kind of legacy platform. And so what a lot of us are working on is how to break out of that, how to create a new ecosystem uh, to have the kinds of connected uh, stacks of services and players uh, such as uh, Dave Bennett just talked about. So one of the things that um, has been done is uh, to try to connect various health systems by what's called health information exchange. And that basically is a way of kind of sending messages between systems through uh, standard processes received by other systems. But it's very difficult, and it requires many to uh, many kinds of linkages. And I borrowed this slide from a colleague named Bill Yaznov, who's really in favor of the idea of having a longitudinal patient-maintained uh, personal health record throughout one's life and giving permissions for healthcare institutions to read and write from it rather than having the other way around, which is a fragmented set of health records by institutions that we now have to try to pull from and exchange across. And I agree with him. And the other part of what he advocates is um, population health organizations that have the kinds of services that Dave was talking about. Well, how do we build that? How do we get to that new kind of ecosystem? And so what we really need is a new kind of uh, architecture that takes advantage of apps and uh, communication, cloud hosting, and standards and interoperability to be able to make that happen. But it doesn't happen overnight, and we have industries that are kind of entrenched that uh, resist it. And this is just an example of the um, different players, patients, the researchers, the providers, uh, the regulatory agencies, the standards, the privacy advocates, et cetera. And we have a cloud in the middle, but it's a, a lot of proprietary clouds. So ha saying that you're in the cloud does not mean that you're sharing data. And so one of the things that we have to work on is how to integrate all that um, with standards. So we were actually engaged in what we call a triple play. On the one hand, we're part of a consortium that's forming, has actually incorporated just in August. Uh, bringing together some of the major healthcare organizations. Intermountain Healthcare is part of it. The VA medical system is part of it. Uh, Regan Street Institute in Indiana just uh, joined. 
Uh, there are others that are participating and haven't joined yet, but it's, it's now in the process of recruiting new members. And, the, uh, and it also has vendor participation. And the idea is to have the major healthcare organizations that, have, that are trying to grapple with connected care and integrating patient-centered care and uh, kind of drive this new system to have enough leverage to actually move the industry and move the vendors to open up their systems to create interoperable apps that work on top of that, that can pull data, integrate it, present it for better viewing, improve uh, decision support, incorporate population uh, analytics into the decision-making process. The second part that we're doing is um, a sandbox kind of test bed incubator where some of these new parts of the ecosystem can actually be put up in a kind of uh, crucible where, let's say, startups or established vendors or faculty at ASU or students or other uh, individuals and groups can come together, try out ideas, help both evolve the ecosystem and build apps and then get them out to market. The third part is then a market um, deployment by creating cloud-based hosting services that organizations like Mayo Clinic or Intermountain or the VA or others can contract with to provide these new layers of functionality. And uh, we're organizing all this right here in Scottsdale. Uh, I should mention that our Department of Biomedical Informatics at ASU is housed on the Mayo campus uh, in Shea Boulevard, uh, right down, uh, not far from here. And uh, we've been doing that for the past three years. I saw Wyatt Decker here from Mayo, and um, we're really delighted by having the interaction with Mayo. But we're also interacting with a lot of the other healthcare care um, organizations here in Arizona, as well as nationally. So the idea is basically to create this sandbox resource that brings together collaborators. And uh, we're forming that. Actually, I have a meeting that I'm going to write after this at Skysong uh, with some of the uh, providers uh, that are going to form this. And uh, the HSBC is the consortium that's setting standards. The standards for this kind of interoperability don't exist yet in all respects. So one of the ways we're trying to get them to come about is to provide the sandbox use cases that demonstrate how useful they are by having major players like Intermountain and others in the VA commissioning those, testing them out, showing how robust they can be. And then when, as the standards are blessed, they also get deployed out into cloud-based services. So we're also starting uh, some ventures, uh, also likely based right here in Scottsdale, yet to be uh, finalized. So this basically says that we've got all of these things uh, beginning to happen here. Uh, we're very excited about it. It's new. I hope that in future years, as we come back to the uh, uh, Cure Corridor, we can report on um, progress on each of these. Uh, I think there are probably people in the audience that we'd love to collaborate with. And so um, just... Uh, have my contact info there. Thank you. You really don't know how difficult this is unless you're doing it. That five minutes goes, you feel like you've been up here for only 90 seconds, but it goes quickly. Our last facilitator in this section is Brian Esterly. He is the Chief Business Development Officer for Matrix Medical Network. Brian? Okay, there you are. So it's tough in a conference when you have the last speaking slot right before cocktail reception. In a similar fashion, it's tough having this slot being the last speaker before we have a talented uh, keynote speaker like Elizabeth. So I'm looking forward to hearing uh, what you have to share with us, Elizabeth. My five-minute drive-by presentation is going to uh, be to present Matrix Medical Network, which is a growth company that's uh, headquartered here in the heart of the Cure Corridor. Um, but more importantly, not only is it a growth company, it's an organization that helps the members that we serve every day. And I want to share an experience with you at the end of the presentation. But so let me talk a little bit about who Matrix is and what we do. Uh, so we were actually founded in Brooklyn, New York in 2000 and relocated to Scottsdale in 2008. Uh, we, are, uh, we were a uh, uh, private equity-owned company for the last three years and were acquired last month by a Tucson-based company, Providence Service Corporation. And we employ nurse practitioners who go into the homes of the members of health plans that we contract with and provide in-home services. Those in-home services can include things like health risk assessments, services for managing chronic conditions, 
specimen collection, medication therapy management. So there's a wide range of uh, services that we're able to provide in the home through the uh, experienced nurse practitioners that we deploy. We work in 33 states uh, and we employ over 700 nurse practitioners. The value uh, in the health plans that we work with is around a couple of different dimensions. First and foremost, we're able to identify unmet medical needs and provide follow-up services or direct them to their physician so that they can get the care that they need, direct them to a care manager so that there's somebody that can monitor and manage them on an ongoing basis. We also uh, provide comprehensive documentation and accurate codes so that we can align the reimbursement that the health plans receive with the risk that they're holding on their members. We're able to provide a very positive experience to the members, which helps contribute to year-over-year -year retention. We work with, uh, con we contract with health plans, like I had said, and we work with a wide range of health plans. So we work with five of the top 10 Medicare Advantage plans, names that you would know, like Humana and Aetna. But we also work with small uh, regional plans, like Health Choice here in uh, Arizona. And um, I'm going to skip the next, I think we covered it. So here's the uh, plug, uh, Mayor, for you and the economic development that we're contributing in Scottsdale. When you look at what a growth company achieves, when I joined Matrix in 2009, we completed 16,000 encounters. Uh, this year, with 15 workdays left in the uh, year, we'll complete 470,000 encounters. So significant year-over-year -year growth, uh, which has supported then significant compounded annual growth of both revenue and EBITDA uh, of over 50%. And then here locally, we are headquartered in Scottsdale. Like I said, we have a presence in 33 states, but here locally, we have over 25% of our workforce. And so we're at 362 employees as we finish the year located here in Scottsdale. When I joined in 2009, we had about 40 employees here in Scottsdale. So we've experienced significant growth. Because of the nature of the uh, individuals that we're hiring, clinical professionals, IT professionals, uh, executives in the headquarters staff, uh, our average salary exceeds not only the national average, but also the Scottsdale healthcare average. And so we're very proud of our growth. We are very excited about the growth prospects in the future uh, in supporting our clients. But like I had said up front, one of the most important things that we do is help members every day when a nurse practitioner goes into the home and, uh, and assesses them. This is a, I'm not a, clini I'm not a clinician, so I'm going to keep this very high level. Unlike you, Dr. Gordon, you uh, had my head spinning. Um, but a uh, nurse practitioner walks in and doesn't know what they're going to uncover. In this situation, nurse practitioner walks in and is presented with a uh, member who has a cardiac issue. She makes an, she's insistent that uh, the individual see a cardiologist immediately cardiac catheterization the next day, stents are uh, inserted, and it's likely that the nurse practitioner saved that member's life at a minimum, certainly put them on a much better trajectory. Of those 470,000 encounters uh, that we will complete in 2014, over 50,000 of them will result in either immediate contact with the PCP, such as in this situation, or a direct referral to care management so that there could be immediate follow-up. And uh, that's really the contribution that we're making in addition to supporting the overall Cure Corridor mission. Uh, thank you for your time today. I wonder if we can have a round of applause for all six of our facilitators. They did a fantastic job. Now to introduce our keynote facilitator, Joan Kerber Walker. We live, guys. When we look at and we talk about the growth of the Cure Quarter, and we look at the growth of Arizona's life science and healthcare industry, we've been on a development path in this state from discovery to development, to delivery. It's interesting that over that same period of time, I've had the opportunity to watch a young woman develop a company and go through the stages of discovery and development and delivery. 
And I remember when she wasn't even 20 years old the first time I saw her speak. What we're talking about, what you heard from our presenters, is the amazing things that can happen when we know how to treat a patient. And the ability to know depends on the ability to diagnose. It's that initial data that tells us what to look for. It's that initial data that tells us if the drug is working. It is that data that tells us when we need to change a patient's treatment. And the um, company that you're going to learn about and the leader that you're going to meet is changing how we look at diagnostics. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Elizabeth Holmes, the founder and CEO of Theranos. Thank you for that. That was really beautiful. Um, you know, it's really special to me to be here today. We're not just doing our first deployment in the context of what we've spent the last 11 years working to realize here in Arizona, here in Scottsdale, but we're building our company here and we're building a group of phenomenal people who are going to be very core to what we do nationally and what we ultimately do internationally. And I've been overwhelmed with the talent and the drive and the passion of the people that we've met here and their commitment to making a difference and to changing the world. I built Theranos around the belief that it's a basic human right for every person to have access to actionable health information at the time it matters. Anyone who's gone through the process of losing someone because you find out too late in the disease progression process to be able to intervene knows that nothing matters more than being able to change that. And there's nothing you wouldn't do to be able to go back and have done something sooner. But the way our healthcare system is set up, insurance won't even pay for a lab test to be done unless someone has a symptom of a disease, which means we're determining someone has cancer from the fact they have a tumor, which means we're finding out too late so often to be able to really do something about it. If you look the word diagnose up, in the dictionary, it will say to determine the onset of disease from its signs and symptoms. But by the time you're symptomatic, by the time you have a tumor, progression has already happened to the extent that it's difficult to begin to change outcomes. And our dream with Theranos is to begin to make it possible to see the onset of disease in time for therapy to be effective. So we've built this mission, this mission of access to actionable information at the time it matters around several core tenants we got into the lab business because lab data drives 80% of clinical decisions. 
And if we can make that lab data more accessible at the time it matters, we can begin to change outcomes. So access for us starts with being able to shift the paradigm of traditional phlebotomy. The paradigm of people having to go take vials and vials and vials of blood in order to get a simple test done. I was listening to one of our team members talk about a physician here in Scottsdale who described the process of a little girl who'd just been diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. She was 11. And her mother explaining to her that she was going to need to go get a lab test done resulted in what this physician described as the tantrum of a two-year-old. Anyone who has watched a little girl, a little boy, go through the process of having to be held down, tears streaming down their face in order to get their lab test done, understands that access to that information that can help to change those people's lives is limited by the fact that in order to get that data, we have to go through such painful experiences. I've seen it in my own life with people I love having gone through cancer, and they're so strong, and they go through so much with the kind of treatments that people have to go through today and the kind of testing that they have to go through week after week after week, it just breaks them down, and it breaks those who love and care for them down. And if we can make it possible for every person to be able to do their lab tests from tiny drops of blood, starting with the first sets of tests that we've introduced here in Phoenix, in Arizona, from tiny drops of blood from a finger, as opposed to vials and vials of blood coming from the arm, we can begin to engage more people in the testing process so that we can begin to get access to the information that we need in time to be able to do something about it. Access for us is also about transparency. We, as individuals, pay for our lab tests. We should know every time what it's going to cost us before we go do a test. The concept of getting a bill in the mail after you've done a test for hundreds, sometimes thousands of dollars, and you don't even know that that's what you're going to have to pay for, limits access to testing. We know so many people who we've been privileged to serve through what we call our wellness centers, which are the service centers that we've been opening here in Arizona, who will come in and tell us, I would have you know, been charged $1,000 for a lab test, so I've been putting it off for a year because I couldn't afford it. And we've been so humbled by the people who have come in with years worth of lab requisitions who are coming now because they can and because they're not as scared to be able to get it done. I was listening to another physician here talking about the fact that they had a patient who came in for an $80 visit, and then they ordered one test for this patient, which cost $150. And they were saying, how could it be that a single test is costing this person more than my visit? And they were talking about someone who didn't have the ability to afford a $150 test. And we had the opportunity to serve that person, and their test cost $12. That creates access to actionable information at the time it matters. Access for us is also about convenience. It's about making this testing process human. We like to think about it as having a heart in the context of 
people coming in for these services, having it be something that they want to do. I've talked so many times about an email we got from a woman named Fran who came to one of our wellness centers here in Arizona. And she sent a very long email about the fact that she thought that the lab testing experience was so much fun and she couldn't wait to go get it done again. And I love that email so much because you don't normally see people walking around being like, that was awesome, let's do it again. And we need to shift the paradigm in terms of consumer engagement in the testing process because if people engage with this information, if we start to recognize that we have a basic right to the information about our bodies and a basic right for our family members, our moms and dads, our kids to get this information so that we can begin to see the onset of disease in time to do something about it, we will change our healthcare system because there's so much that you can do if you find out early in the disease progression process. So access, access is about access to actionable information. And if we can reduce the sample size associated with testing, we can make it possible to run more and more tests from a tiny droplet of blood so that when someone gets a requisition done, instead of going through the paradigm that exists today, which is I go see my doc, doc says, Elizabeth, haven't seen you in a year, go do a lab. So I go do my lab, come back, doc says, you know, your hemoglobin was really low, I don't know what kind of anemia that's associated with, but I'm gonna put you on this drug, go do another lab test, because now I need to figure out why that value was out of range, and the reason I need to go do another lab test is because now different tubes, maybe they took a purple top the first time, now this time they need a green top and other color tops, have to be drawn, and then come back for my third office visit, at which point they finally get this data, say six weeks later, take you off an initial drug, and let's say it's iron deficiency, right? So they've switched your therapy because now they have the lab data that makes the diagnosis actionable. Well, if the sample size is tiny, you can begin to build into the physician ordering process that if something's out of range, I want to run those follow-on tests right there in the initial lab so that when I see my patient, that visit becomes actionable. And if we can shift the reality in our world today, which is that 40 to 60% of people do not go get those tests done when physicians tell them to do it, that engagement, that compliance, will begin to make it possible for physicians to have the actionable information to take care of people at the time it matters. Healthcare in our country is the largest driver of bank bankruptcy today. I was talking at lunch about the fact that we've seen people traveling in from Nevada or in buses across the state here to be able to come to the locations that we've created here because of the fact that we've decided to bill Medicare, Medicaid, and everybody else the same price and a price that's discounted off of their reimbursement rates starting at less than 50% of their rates. That means that over the course of the next 10 years, we have the opportunity to save taxpayers in Arizona over $1.3 billion in direct out-of-pocket savings. And what's so exciting to us is that this can be a model for what can be done nationally. I believe that the solution to our challenges in healthcare is the individual. And if we can engage people, we can begin to change outcomes because it's very difficult to do it working through the system. But if you can begin to change it, I talk all the time about the fact that 
20% of our entire healthcare spend in this country is associated with type 2 diabetes. And we have 80 million Americans who are pre-diabetic. 90% of them don't know it. And yet if they did, and we could begin to give them the tools to understand the fact that you can reverse it through lifestyle, through diet, through exercise, we start to change our healthcare system. And my dream for what we do here in creating this model in Arizona is that we show through engagement of the individual, we can begin to shift the care delivery system and we can begin to show that a preventative care model is possible. And we're doing that now, this future that we're talking about is here and we can't think of a better place to be able to do it than here in Arizona. It's wonderful to be here with you. That's great. Does it still give you the shivers when people do that to you? When they, everybody starts clapping? No, I was, I was so humbled by your, by your, your introduction. That was, that was very wonderful. Well, I actually have been watching you since you were about 19. So it, <laughs> okay. it is really very, very cool to be here with you. Well, thank you. And, you know, we kind of went over some questions ahead of time, some of which I'm going to skip because it's much more fun just to talk. Let's and you all it. get to listen in. We talk about overnight successes. And, you know, it's not everybody that gets to have the cover of Forbes and the cover of Fortune. And, um, but you're not an overnight success. This has been a journey of over a decade. Mm. And the passion for what you do, okay, goes all the way back to some very intrinsic things. I happen to know you don't like needles. I hate needles. <laughs> um, but more importantly, it's the people we love and the people that we care about and how we see that. Mm. And that comes through, not just from you, but from all of your teammates that we've met. So let's talk about team for a minute. Yeah. You're gonna grow 500 people here in Arizona, but more than that, you're gonna grow a lot more people around the country. Mm. The, the passion the mission. As you grow, how are you going to keep that together? Well, I think it's, it's exactly what you said. It's, it's about mission because, you know, this, this is a, a world and an industry that, that really hasn't changed for a very long time. And, um, and any time you try to make a change, it's really hard. And a lot of things go wrong, but you do it because you love it so much. And we've been so privileged to build a team that's here because they want to do the greatest work of their life. And they want to do something that they can look back on for the rest of their life and know that they made a change in the world. And every single person that we hire, I've, I've had the privilege of interviewing almost all of them. Now, I don't get to interview every single one, but we try. You know, I, because what we're looking for is, is that just obsessive passion with the mission. Because when you love it that much, no matter how hard it is and no matter how many things go wrong, you figure out how to make it work. And, and that's, that's how we hire, that's how we build. We, we have a company that's built around promoting people from within mm -hmm. because the leaders become the people who embody the values. And that's... Uh, that's so important to us in the context of establishing a long-term culture. And we've seen some of the greatest companies that have come over the last 20 years, mm -hmm. okay, focus on the people first. And we mm -hmm. saw that with Southwest Airlines. We've seen that you know, in, in other industries. And I think that that's a very important lesson that you've learned very early. Yeah. Um, you know, we have some strongly mission-driven organizations here. Yeah. Wyatt, I, I think you're still out there. You know, Mayo is a great example yeah. of one that has transcended decades now. 
yeah. and the yeah. opportunity to work together with that. Absolutely, and we, we have so much respect for it. I think you know, one of the things that's really important to us is, is coming from Silicon Valley, you see you know, a lot of people who will move from one company to the next every two years, right? Yeah. And we're not interested in that. We're interested in building something that you know, people go to because they want to have a career. And the types of people that we've been able to engage here and have the privilege of joining our team here have very much had that mindset. And you know, that, that's what we look for in, in California. That's what we look for here. But it's, um, it's been really wonderful to, to be able to begin building that culture here. Yeah. So I think you know, as you look at some of the other lessons that you're learning, you yeah. know, and, and I, I, I mean, when you're my age, you can say learned. You're still learning. Yes, hopefully uh, always. Always. Yeah. Well, I'm going to be a grandma next year, so I've got a whole new set of things to learn. <laughs> But as we look at um, the things that are ahead of us, and we've seen since the mapping of the human genome and, and a whole new range of diagnostics tests that are, that are now coming. Um, and as you said earlier, you know, phlebotomy has not changed in generations. No. It's just what we look for. No. No. Um, where do you see the next big opportunity coming from? Well, I think, I think it starts with the engagement of the individual. I mean, one of the things that, you know, I have spent a lot of time thinking about is, you know, as we listen to the people who come into our wellness centers, often we'll hear people say something to the effect of, you know, my family has a hereditary condition of this or that, mm -hmm. and I wanted to get a test done but my doctor said that insurance wouldn't pay for it, right? Going back to the mm -hmm. not yet symptomatic point. So they get their physician to do a requisition for a test and they're paying out of pocket. And what you're seeing there is the desire of the individual to engage in their own health. Mm -hmm. And yet in many states across this country, the ability of an individual to order a test, for example, if I wanna go order an allergy test in California, it's illegal, right? right? I can buy a gun, I can shoot myself, mm -hmm. but if I stop eating peanuts because I took an allergy test that I ordered for myself, right, not okay. And, uh, and I, think, I think a huge frontier is gonna be the ability for the individual to be able to engage in their own health, right? By mm -hmm. law, if I wanna be able to know whether I have an allergy for something, I should be able to order a test. Right. Now, the physician plays an integral role in how you interpret that information, mm -hmm. but we're living in a world in which people don't even go get the test done that the physicians tell them to do. Right. So if we can shift the mindset and begin to engage consumers to get the data, physicians are gonna have so much more to work from mm -hmm. in terms of helping to take care of people. And people want the engagement with the physician to figure out what to do. Right. But, but a shift in consumer engagement, I think, I think is really the future. And, and I agree with you. I know here in Arizona, diagnostics is a true strength, and I'm sure that's one of the reasons you came here. Uh, very much so. Um, and, and for the audience, to put it in perspective, when you talk about something like early diagnosis, um, lung cancer is probably the clearest set of statistics we have because it's been so deeply studied. If we diagnose cancer, lung cancer in stage four, which is when we normally diagnose it, um, the outcome is not going to be good. Okay? The five-year survival rate is around 80%. Or, uh, no, that's backwards. The 20% will make it five years. If we can catch it in stage one or stage two, the five-year survival rate is over 80%. Yeah. What we're talking about is the ability for patients who, through their behaviors, past or present, to be able to go and get a simple screening 
so that they can talk to their doctor would save millions of lives in the United States and tens of hundreds or hundreds of millions of lives across the world. That's what you're seeing the forefront of right now. And it's happening here in Arizona. And I see Janet Spear from Celgene in the audience. And I see um, you know, our, our doctors from Mayo and Scottsdale Healthcare and the way they've partnered. Okay. And we are coming up with amazing therapies. But the therapies don't do any good if we don't know there's not a problem in the first place. Now, I believe there's 26 states right now that allow a patient to order a test independent of a doctor just to do that basic screening. Yep. Not diagnosis, right. just screening. Right. Um, Arizona's not one of those states yet. No, but that'll change. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm convinced of that. I mean, I, I, think, I think this is inevitable. I, I don't think anybody ever sat down and voted saying, yeah, I wanna give away my right to get information about my body, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, this has evolved over a long period of time, and, uh, and I think if, if you can begin to make the testing process more accessible, uh, you can begin to engage people in it, right? I mean, in the type 2 diabetes example, an A1C test in California is illegal, right? How are we going to solve the diabetes problem? Right? I mean, it's just, it's not gonna happen if we can't engage people in getting access to this data. Right? Um, but I think, you know, the other opportunity that we have is to use what you have learned and what your team is continuing to learn to help other companies in Arizona Absolutely. develop yeah. and discover and, and get those diagnostics get those therapies, get those medical devices to the patient. Yeah, uh, and, and we were talking earlier about our focus on being here. I mean, this work that's going on here as a healthcare hub and a healthcare model is very inspiring and it's, it's one of the many reasons that we want to be here, so very much so. And there are great opportunities to do that. Yeah. Um, the other area is clinical trials because yeah. diagnostics, especially companion diagnostics, yeah are going to be so integral to that process. Yeah. The Critical Path Institute is working across functionally with all of the major drug companies and all the major diagnostics companies to share best practices pre-competitively so that we can bring these therapies to market faster. Mm -hmm. And they have a huge focus on companion diagnostics and that's a great opportunity yeah. that where we can all work together. Yeah. Um, what are some of the other ways that we can all work together to help you grow and to help our industry grow? I think, I mean, the ability to, to channel the talent here, there's incredible people here, and you know, as, as we were talking about, we're working to build really core pieces of our business here mm -hmm. that are going to be integral in what we do nationwide and, and beyond. Yeah, and, and tapping into that talent is, is invaluable. Yeah, so, um, so that's something that we're, we're very focused on. And, and then I think what you're already doing in terms of the broader engagement in this healthcare focus in the community, because there are so many centers of excellence here and the ability for people as individuals to begin thinking about engagement in health, mm -hmm. in our opinion, is the first step in changing the healthcare system. And, and I think that awareness, this, this event, um, is a wonderful thing in, in that context. Yeah. Well, thank you. And thank you for what you've done for patients. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the inspiration that you have been to not just young people, but especially young women. <coughs> And we need more young women to step up in this field. Absolutely. And um, we'll, we'll have some more conversations on that later. Yeah, okay. But I think um, at this point, what, did I, what should I have asked you that I didn't? It's the hardest question. <laughs> um, uh, you know, um, we're, we're really 
um, feel very lucky to, to be able to be here and, and to work with people here and to be able to build this model here. And um, I'm just very grateful to the community here for how you've embraced us and, um, and how much people have begun to work with us as we build out these wellness centers and fine tune and figure out a model of how we can shift the way that lab testing can become more accessible to people. And I just want to say thank you for that. Well, let's do some really amazing things together. We're in. Is the deal? Yeah, Is the deal, ladies and gentlemen? What do you say to Elizabeth? Well, thank you so very much, Elizabeth. That was inspiring all the way around. And I'd like to just ask for everybody to give another round of applause to all of our presenters and all of our speakers. I'd also like to thank again our sponsors who made it all possible to the Plaza Companies, APS, Kitchell, and AZ Bio. So thank you very much for your support. And I'd be negligent if I didn't say specifically a big thanks to my economic development department who put this all together. So thank you, and I'd like to give them a hand as well. So thank you for joining us. Have a rest of, great rest of the day. <laughs>